Well, hi, everyone. This is part two of our, your favorite subject, <laughs> tithing, um, in the New Covenant this time. Tithing in the New Covenant. I say that a little jokingly because I believe many of you do tithe. Uh, many believers do not. And uh, some feel that they have their legitimate reasons for not tithing or whatever. So let's explore tithing in the New Covenant. I think you'll find this message today very, very uh, thought-provoking. You might disagree with me on some things. Uh, write me, call me if you have disagreements, and let's figure this out. But use scripture if you disagree, okay? We are, let's start with this, we are in the new covenant. We are in the new covenant. Just excuse me, i got to set my timer here. Forgot to do that. I love it when I hear sermons on tithing from Protestant ministers, mega church Protestant ministers, and they give a sermon on tithing, but these same people will tell you in many, many sermons that we're no longer under the Old Covenant. We're in the New Covenant, uh, except for tithing. And so it, it always fascinates me to realize that. Uh, there are differences. We're going to read and find out today in the New Covenant as a, compared to the Old Covenant. And um, I have sermons on the fact that we are in the New Covenant and how that's different and it's not a renewed covenant. God said in Jeremiah 31, 31, Jeremiah 31, 31 to 33, that when I give this new covenant, it will not be like the covenant that I gave them when I led them out of Egypt, brought them to Mount Sinai. It will not be like that. I'll write my laws on their hearts, on their hearts. It's not going to be all this physical stuff so much as spiritual stuff. Uh, obviously, that emits itself as physical evidence. But so many Hebrew roots people, Church of God people who keep Sabbath, still seem to act and live and believe as if we're in the New Covenant. I mean, Old Covenant. In the Old Covenant. Oh, or they'll say we're in a New Covenant minus the temple, the priests, the Levites, and uh, sacrifices. Uh, but other than that, it's pretty much like the Old Covenant. Hear my sermon on the New Covenant. I give something like 18 or 20 points that sh beyond what I just said that show we are very, very different in the New Covenant. Now, if we have no temple, no Levites, no priests, no sacrifices, that affects tithing tremendously because tithing had a lot to do with all of that. And so let's, I hope you follow me with this now. I want to focus two-thirds of my time, if I can, on the New Covenant ways of supporting God's work Tithing, whatever you want to call it. But I think you'll understand as we go through. A lot of you are, and I did, I did. A lot of people use the Old Testament scriptures on tithing. There are so many to teach us about tithing in the New Covenant. That's why I'm covering the differences today as well. I'm not against tithing. I've said several times, just so you know that I'm not against it. I'm not trying to brag. I really am not. I don't want to blow my reward, okay? But I'm not against tithing, but my wife and I have tithed for well over 50 years. And we continue to do so in a new covenant way in the new covenant. In God's true tithing laws, you all, in fact, in any of God's laws, if you really examine them carefully, you see that God is such a loving, wonderful, kind being. And that, that applies also to tithing. What you've heard, though, is not that God loves you as we talk about tithing and is concerned about you, but what we tend to hear about God's statement about tithing is, you've robbed God. You're a robber. You're a thief. You've robbed God. How dare you? How? And my tithes and offerings. And that's quoting directly out of Malachi 3, verses 8 and 9. But no matter what our topic is, Jesus constantly told the Pharisees and others in different ways, don't forget about God's love, God's mercy, God's faith, His gentleness. So no matter what our topic is, we have to talk about that too. And that's revealed in the tithing laws as well. God did not, for example, God did not require tithing if you had nothing to tithe on. If you didn't have a suitable base amount. He didn't require, didn't want people tithing to the point where they had to worry if they could feed the family. Um, 
you remember we covered last time, you didn't tithe on your herds and flocks unless you had at least 10 goats, 10 sheep, 10 oxen, 10 cows. You had to have enough land to have a harvest. If you had no land and no crops, therefore, and no herds, you had nothing to tithe on. I heard a sermon by somebody who said tithing applied to everyone, no exclusions. Well, if you didn't have any land and no crop, you were excluded. My voice must have gone back to puberty there. <laughs> you were excluded. Anyway, as I've heard in so many sermons, as those pre and those preachers also like to teach about second and third tithe, I'd like you just to ask them, those who preach second and third tithe, do you do a second tithe? Do you submit or keep a third tithe? Ask them, do you tithe a third, you yourself? I think you might be shocked. So welcome again, everyone, to Light on the Rock. I'm Philip Shields, your host, founder of Light on the Rock. It's a free site. Thanks for coming again. If some of you are coming here because you've seen ads for our sermons, if you like what we're teaching and you feel fed by what we're teaching, I'm going to ask you to keep coming because we can't keep paying for ads. We've just started doing that. And uh, I have a man who, uh, he, that's part of the way he ties, is to buy us ads and so on, pay for it. And if you feel led by the contents and by the teachings, tell others about it and keep coming back, okay? I doubt that we can afford too many ads, so, so keep that in mind. Now, last time I tried to cover tithing in the Old Testament, and I gave you as honest a, uh, an outlook as I could. I told you again, I have tithe, I keep tithing. I'm not saying I'm against it. Tithing as a law, though, was not given until the time of Moses as a clearly stated law. So many ministers go back to Genesis 14 to show that Abraham kept the law of tithing. I showed you last time how uh, Hebrews 7, 4 says that what, he, what Abraham did, Abram did was he tithed on the spoils of war. That's what he tithed on. After the others took their, their share of the spoils, what he had as his share, he tithed 10%. Then I believe he gave the rest back to the king of Sodom. He didn't want to look like he was being enriched by keeping the spoils. Uh, that was a voluntary act. And I, I, I mentioned last time, if you doubt what I just said, go and read Numbers 31. I'm not going to take the time to read it. I want you to go read it. These are the rules God gave on spoils of war. And not one time in that whole chapter will you see God saying, read God saying, and be sure you give me a tenth of it. Submit that to the Levites, the priests, the tabernacle, whatever, a tenth of it, of the spoils. Nowhere does he give that as part of the tithing law. So to say that Abram, that Abram was tithing because it was the law is not correct. We don't know if Isaac tithed because we're not told. Many of you assume, and I can assume he might have, uh, for I, I know Abram, that he has taught his children that they should keep the laws and statutes and all that. So, But it's not clearly stated if Isaac tithed. Since it was not a law to tithe on spoils, I don't know if he did. We come down to Jacob. Jacob tithed, was offering to tithe voluntarily, God Almighty, if you will do these five things which we covered last time. If you give me safe passage to where I'm going and back home safely and clothing and supply my needs and keep me in, in safely in the way, then I will tithe and then you will be my God. Um, Jacob's wording does not denote obeying a tithing law as much as it shows me he was willing to show his appreciation to God by tithing if you will, in fact, take care of me and keep me in the way and protect me. The tithing law, as a law, was not given until the days of Moses. It's part of the Old Covenant. Last time we read Leviticus 27, verses 30 to 34. You may want to write that down, go back and read it again. Everything belongs to God. Everything in the whole universe belongs to him. He made it, it's his. But he says 10% of that is holy to me. 10% specifically, he said of the yield of the land 
and of the every tenth of the herds, flocks, and, and, and oxen, and so on. But 10% of the grains, the fruits, the olives, the wine, the produce of the land, you need to give that back to me through the Levites. We mentioned all that before. Nothing, nothing is said in the Old Covenant about tithing on salary, on wages, tithing on what you produced as a seamstress, as a woodcutter, carpenter, as a cowboy. And don't mix up tithing with temple offerings or first fruit offerings. They were different things. Nowhere is tithing mentioned on wages, harvest of fish, or whatever you produce as a tent maker, carpenter, nothing like that. It's just not there. People read into it. And I've heard, I've heard so many sermons and read so many articles on tithing and getting ready for this. I want to hear all sides. And so many says, well, these are laws that fit an agrarian society. And since we're not an agrarian society, now we have to tithe on with money out of our salary, 10% of our salary, deducting the, uh, the, the cost of making that, uh, that salary, uh, the, the tithe on the increase, and big discussions about what increase are and so on. All right, Bible doesn't mention any of that. It doesn't say later on you can change my rules and instead of tithing on grain and all that, you got to tithe on salary. It, it, it just doesn't say that. I'm just being honest. I'm just being honest. The main first tithe was given to Levites. The tribe of Levi, there's a section of the tribe of Levi who were the sons of Aaron, and those, were, those became the priests. All priests were Levites, but only a few Levites were priests. The Levites who were not priests were assistants to the priests, and they helped them with the work, the baking. The, they were the singers. They were the trained personnel. Only Levites could receive this tithe. That's in Numbers 18, 21, and 24. Only Levites could receive this tithe. If you were not a Levite, it would be a sin for you to have taken the tithes. Jews today feel it would be a sin to tithe because no matter who they would give it to, there, there wouldn't be Levites, there wouldn't be priests, and there would be no temple that would receive those in the storehouses at the temple as well. And they feel it would be sinning to tithe. Hebrews 7 verse 5, Indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi, Hebrews 7 5, who receive the priesthood, have a commandment to receive tithes from the people. Have a command from God to receive the tithes from the people according to the law. Now it's very clearly stated, tithing by this time, time of Moses, time of Levi and the priests, is now a law. And God's saying, here's how much, it's 10%, and here's to who you to give it to, and here's when you give it, and when you harvest, obviously, that would work out to be, for many of them, three times a year. In the spring harvest for the barley, summer harvest for, for uh, wheat, the late spring, early summer, and then the autumn harvest of everything else that came up, the, the big harvest in, in the fall. The Levites received the tithes. They, in turn, gave 10% of what they got to the priests. There's no mention of priests, by the way, ever having to tithe on what they received. So again, the statement that there's no exclusions about tithing. Everybody has a tithe. I see no verse that says the priests had to tithe as well. If I'm wrong, show me, and I'll try to put that in here. Um, and if there's no, today there's no literal physical priesthood, no literal physical Levites, no literal physical temple. I know we're the temple, I know all that, but... For me to say as an ordained minister, I am a spiritual Levite, I don't see that in Scripture unless you make a lot of jumps and leaps out of Hebrews 7, the Melchizedek priesthood. Therefore, if there's a Melchizedek priesthood, then the priest under him must be spiritual Levites. Spiritual. No, we're, there's only one Melchizedek, okay? Uh, one had to have a base amount. I covered that already. If you're too poor to own land, no grain and all that, you had nothing to tithe on. Be sure you understand the temple itself was not supported just by tithes. The temple itself was supported also by the half-shekel temple tax to every male over 20 years old. 
Plus, they gave first fruits of their harvest, their fruit, their crops, and they um, plus tithes of the grain harvest. But it was supported by more than just tithes. It was first fruits. It was taxes. It was uh, uh, it was uh, voluntary donations. So there was temple money, lots of money going to the temple, plenty of money going to the temple. You'll also find that in the Old Testament, again, I think I just said this, but three times a year, some feel it was once a year, but three times a year, the three harvest seasons, when you could see what you were bringing in, that you would tithe uh, probably three times a year, but not monthly, not weekly, not daily, okay? I hope that's clear. And then three times a year, they were to present themselves to God at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles, and have a holy day offering three times. Those specific three holy days are mentioned, not just three times, but those specific three holy days are the times to collect the holy day offerings. There's nothing in scripture that says to collect holy day offerings on Feast of Trumpets, which is coming up. And I have lots of sermons on Feast of Trumpets on my website, or on the Day of Atonement, or on um, the eighth day after the feast. No, there's nothing in Scripture to collect Holy Day offerings on those, yet so many do. I don't know. It's not, it's not what God says. So there's, more, there's so much more in part one. <clears throat> now let's go into the New Covenant. I'm going to give a high overview first, and then we'll go back and finish, if we have time, some more from the Old Testament on tithing, on the second tithe, third tithe, and Holy Day offering, and so on. Again, in the New Covenant, Keep in mind, we are in a new covenant. There are no Levites to tie to, no priesthood, no temple, no, no sacrifices. There's nothing about tithing salary in the old covenant. Unless you redeemed your tithes, you wanted to keep the animals or whatever, or, or on the second tithe, if you wanted to go to Jerusalem and it was too far to carry bags of grain, uh, that you would then convert it to money and take the money with you. That's the only time. That's not salary. That's, that's taking the tithe and converting it to money if you had a long distance journey to do on the way to the feast, the holy days. Then the Old Testament scriptures on second and third tithe, a lot of argument, by the way, from many, many avenues. Like I said, I've read a lot of articles, heard a lot of sermons. Some say tithes with just one tithe used three different ways. Otherwise, how can you call it a tithe, a 10%? If you had a second 10% and a third, <laughs> that's more than, now, you have, now you're up to 30%. That's that argument. Then there are the others like Josephus who said there were three different definite tithes. And uh, the beliefs and the teachings go all over the board on this one. Because the third tithe was in the third and sixth year. You had nothing to tithe on the seventh because you were letting the land rest. And then you started again the following third year and then sixth year and so on. So it would be the third, the sixth, and the tenth year, you see, and so on. I hope you follow me on that. I covered that a little bit last time. So in a sense, though, since we're in the New Covenant, get this, it doesn't matter where all these arguments about this and that and what's, what's an increase and what's a third tithe and when do you do it and how do you do it. Do you submit it in or do you keep it for, you know, all of that's a moot point because we're in the new covenant. We're not under the old covenant laws on tithing and sacrifices and all that. Tithing, temple, Levites, priests, and sacrifices, we're all interconnected. You've got to keep that in mind in the old covenant. Now, let's talk about first what Jesus, what Yeshua said. I, I like to call him Jesus. I like to call him Yeshua. All right, Yeshua is the Hebrew name. Mama called him. Regarding money, Jesus said, he tells us to focus our money in a way that builds an investment in heaven. That's our priority. Matthew 6, verses 19 to 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Do not. You're supposed to invest the money wisely. The parable of the guys given all these talents and money. But don't make that your focus. Moth, rust, destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Treasures in heaven. Where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now remember also that as we read some statements here from Jesus, 
that so many of the things that he's going to say, he was still in the old covenant. His life, his entire life was still in the old covenant. He had to fulfill all the laws of the, new co- of the old covenant. And Romans, 7, uh, Romans 8, 4 tells us he did. He did fulfill all of those laws of the old covenant. Some people believe that if Jesus said something, like in Matthew 23, that therefore you ought to have tithed, you know, you ought to have without leaving tithing undone, you you know, we'll read that in a minute, that that's positive proof that we're supposed to be tithing uh, the the way we're taught in the Old Covenant. He was under the Old Covenant when he said that. I'll come back to that in a minute. If you have that kind of standard of belief, then you've got to believe that when he said, when you bring your offering, your gift, your sacrifice to the altar— and then suddenly remember, somebody has something against you. You have something against, against them. He says, leave your sacrifice, your, your offering there, your gift there at the altar, at the temple, at the altar. Go make up, make amends first, then come back. Is he therefore teaching us that we still must offer animal sacrifices? Of course he's not. So that's the point I'm trying to get across. Always read things in context. Who's saying it? Under what context? And... Um, People point to Matthew 23, 23 to show that tithing is still in the new covenant. Let's read what he said. Matthew 23, 23 and 24. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You pay tithe of mint, anise, and cumin. These are products of the ground, okay, leaves and so on. And have, but have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. These, justice, mercy, and faith, you ought to have done without leaving the other, tithing, undone. Yeah, you, you should have tithed, but why are you ignoring the big stuff? You blind guides, you strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. So, even Jesus is saying, tithing is not the most important of all things. That's what he just said. Justice, mercy, faith. Those are far more important, he just said, okay? He also said, Matthew 22, he, in, he, would, he would have been very careful with the sequence of his words. He said, make sure you pay your taxes first so you don't get in trouble, so you don't go to jail, and also so you know what you have to tithe on in the Old Covenant. So Matthew 22, verse 21, they had come up to him, the Pharisees had come up to him and had taunted him by saying, uh, should we pay taxes? And so Jesus said, um, bring me a coin. Uh, and, and then he says, uh, Matthew 22, verse 20, he said to them, whose image and inscription is on this coin? And they said, well, Caesar's. And he said to them, render therefore to Caesar, Matthew 22, 20, 21. He said, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Pay your taxes and to God the things that are God's. Because you can't even rightfully, correctly determine what your tithes in the Old Covenant would be until you've taken out the cost of taxes. Uh, Definitely a cost that would take away from what you had. Some of you don't believe in paying taxes at all. Go back and read Romans 13, verses 6 and 7. Please do start paying taxes. Yeshua tells you, you who won't believe in taxes, and render to Caesar things, the government, the things that are the governments, okay? What else did he teach? He condemned again the Pharisees and others who had this tradition that if you were going to give mom and dad some money that they badly needed, but if you went up to them and said, dad, mom, I, I've dedicated this money I was going to give to you. I've dedicated it to the temple. It's, it's korban. It's, it's, uh, it's a gift to God. Okay, Mark 7, verses 9 to 13. All too well you reject the commandment of God that says, so, you may keep your, so, so that you may keep your tradition, you, 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 but you reject the commandment. Moses said, honor your father and mother, and if you curse your mom and dad, you're to be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father and mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father and mother, making the word of God no effect. Because of your stupid traditions. I'm sorry, the word stupid wasn't in there. The traditions are the oral law, the Mishnah, the Midrash, okay, the, uh, and, and, you know, the things that are not, the, that, the Jews believe that that all has precedence. 
over the written law, which is so bad. We see Christ right here. Of course, they reject Christ. But Christ right here says, your tradition is ruining God's laws. Now, Paul taught the same thing in 1 Timothy 5, verses 3 to 4. 1 Timothy 5, verses 3 to 4. Honor widows who are really widows. But if a widow has, in other words, she has no one else. She's all by herself. If a widow has children or grandchildren, let them, the children and grandkids, first learn to show piety at home and repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. Now jump to verse 8. First uh, Timothy 5, verse 8. If anyone does not provide for his own, especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith. It's worse than an unbeliever. You've got to take care of mom and dad, grandparents and others, people in your household. You've got to do it. That was a priority that Paul put out there. That was a priority that Jesus put out there. Don't tell me you can't help your parents because you have to give a certain amount to the temple. Nonsense. Honor your father and mother first. Paul says, the widows, before you start assisting them, their relatives are to take care of them. You're worse than an unbeliever. I say all this in context of the New Covenant. There are countries in Europe, Australia and Europe. I know Australia is not in Europe, okay? But I'm saying other countries than the USA where taxation is quite high. And if you believe in three tithes, 30% on top of a 60% Swedish taxation, for example, up to 60%, that leaves you nothing, nothing to honor your parents, nothing to take care of your family. If you don't take care of your own, you've denied the faith and are worse than an unbeliever. Okay? So God doesn't want you to have just little or nothing left. God isn't like that. He may require you to give up everything uh, in rare circumstances, like Yeshua did to the rich young ruler who says, what must I do to be saved? And uh, Jesus says, you know, keep the commandments. He said, which one? He names the commandments about man and love your neighbor as yourself because that was this man's weak point. So then Jesus came back and said, you know what? Sell everything you have, give it to the poor, then come and follow me. And he could not. He didn't normally do that, but he did that to this one because that's what he needed. Jesus also set up the foundation for understanding you're not limited to 10%. He watched this poor widow give 100% of what she had, all that she had, a couple pennies or a penny that she put into the treasury of the temple. That poor widow, Mark 12, we have it posted right now, as he sat opposite the treasury, watched people putting in money into the treasury, into the offering box. Many rich people put in large amounts. A poor widow came in through her last couple of mics, as King James says, just a penny. And he says, you know, that woman just gave 100%. Of what she, remember, he knew thoughts, and he knew he was God in the flesh. He gave, she gave everything out of her poverty, everything. So if you even want to give 100% sometimes, you got a big bonus or whatever, and you want to give 100% of that, that's up to you. I'm not going to teach that, but I'm saying Yeshua allowed it. He didn't go running over to her and said, Woman, stop. You don't need to do that. No, he let her do it. And I'm sure. I personally just have a strong feeling in my heart that he must have said a few words in private prayer to God the Father and angels, even to tell the angels, I want you to bless that woman. I want you to make things happen for her. And have people bring her food and so on. Because I'm so impressed with her giving 100% of what she had. He also taught us, of course, when we tithe or do good alms, when we do good things, do it privately. Don't be talking about it. I've said a little bit that I tithe and have tithed, just so you know where I'm coming from. I'm not trying to tell you how much I tithe or anything like that, okay? Which be a private thing between you and God. Now, tithing is supporting the work of God in the New Testament. Aside from Matthew 23, 23, which was still talking about the Old Covenant, and aside from Hebrews 7, 4, which says Abraham tithed of all the spoils, never is anything mentioned about tithing as a law in the New Covenant. I tithe, I give. So don't jump ahead and think that I, I'm teaching against it. We have to understand, remember, remember what I said last time. 
If you're going to tithe the old covenant way, then do it the old covenant, covenant way and give it to Levites. Don't say you're tithing like it says in Leviticus and Numbers and so on and then give it to whoever you like. It's got to go to Levites and priests who give to priests and to the temple in Jerusalem. And they're not there. None of them are there. If you're going to tithe in the new covenant, let's do it the new covenant way. So we'll talk about that. How was Jesus supported? Did Jesus at any time Tell his disciples, hey, you, you know, I'm Melchizedek or the order of Melchizedek. So you're, you're the order of spiritual Levites, although not Levites, but of the Melchizedek priesthood. So you can receive tithes and I can receive tithes. But you know what? That's not what he did or said. He was not supported by tithes. Can I be so strong as to tell you that had Yeshua received tithes, in his lifetime, that would have been a sin because only Levites were to receive tithes. Think about that now. So how was he supported as he walked around, traveled around? Luke 8, verses 1 to 3. Luke 8, verses 1 to 3. came to pass afterwards that he went through every city and village, preaching and bringing the glad tidings, the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, she was from Magdala, out of whom came seven demons, Joanna, the wife of Judah, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others who provided for him from their substance. doesn't say tithes just from their own money, their wealth, their income. <clears throat> so our Savior Yeshua accepted food, accommodation, financial help. He even invited himself to lunch like he did to Zacchaeus in Luke 19. Zacchaeus, come down from that tree. I got to have lunch over at your place. I hear you got a lot of money and a lot of food. Let's go. Come on, come on. <laughs> our master taught his disciples to accept food, accept accommodation during their ministry, and never did he say, you can, of course, of course, safely receive tithes. He could not have said that. That would have been an awful, awful sin, as only Levites were supposed to receive tithes. I'm going to keep saying that, because you're not paying tithes to Levites. Okay? There's something else we, we do in the New Covenant. Matthew 10, verses 7 to 9, As you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick. It's interesting, he doesn't say pray for the sick. He says heal them. I keep praying God give us his power. That when we pray, there's a healing that takes place. Cleanse the lepers. There's another one. Raise the dead. Cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Don't be charging people for your DVDs, ministers. Don't be doing that. Freely you've received, freely give. If you're accepting tithes from people, you know good and well, ministers out there, you mega church ministers especially. You've got lots of money to let everybody have those DVDs you're producing professionally. I know it costs. I know there's postage. You've got enough, though. You've certainly got enough for your big old expensive house or two or three or four, a yacht, G G4 planes, G5 planes. Rings on your finger with multiple diamonds on them. Mine's just a plain old uh, gold band that I've always had. Anyway, freely you've received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts, nor bag for your journey. Don't take two clothes, two sets of clothes, two tunics, nor sandals. Don't take extra sandals and tunics or staffs. For a worker is worthy of his hire. A worker is worthy of his food. I think it's shameful that mega churches who strongly teach tithing still charge $45, $150, $200. Stop. Please stop. All of you, stop. We don't ever charge here at Light on the Rock. Now let's see what Paul says in the New Testament about financial support. First of all, remember that in Acts 15, when they all came together as to what are we going to tell the Gentiles 
Nothing is said here about tithing in Acts 15 in their letter. Nothing. They were told they didn't have to be circumcised. They were told not to eat blood or meat offered to idols and stay away from sexual sins. Nothing about tithing. Paul, who was never shy about pointing out areas where the church that he was writing to was falling short of the glory of God, he would tell them, quit going to court against each other. Why are you divided up into factions? 1 Corinthians 1. And why do you say, I'm a Paul, I'm a Peter, I'm a Paulus? He says, we're all one. Come on, stop all this. And why are you tolerating the sexual sin in your congregation? 1 Corinthians 5. Get rid of him. Put him out. Why are you getting drunk at the feast of, I mean, Passover, I mean? 1 Corinthians 11. And on and on and on. He was certainly not shy to mention areas they needed to be taught. But in the New Covenant, he never one time says you should have been tithing to us. He couldn't. There was still a temple. There were still Levites. They were in the New Covenant by this point, but there was no stated. He never uses the word tithe or tithe or tithes, tithing. He never uses any of those words in all of his writings. I tithe on my salary and income. I don't have much now. I've retired. My full-time work is now light on the rock. But that's my choice. It's not a New Testament law to tithe. If it is, Show me, because we're not under the Old Covenant anymore. We're under the New Covenant. If you think it's a law in the New Testament, then show me. Tithe, and believe me, I've read and read, read so much, pro and con on everything. Tithing is between you and God. <clears throat> God looks upon our hearts. He doesn't like it when we feel like, oh, another tithe check I got to write. Oh, so much money. That's called tithing because you have to, out of compulsion, because it's a law, you think, as opposed to being glad and cheerfully saying, I'm glad to give God this tithe. 2 Corinthians 9, 5-7. I thought it necessary to urge these brothers to go to you, and because he was collecting money, a gathering of food, not money so much, but food and grain, and probably money too, but to help the poor, poverty, famine-stricken Jews in Jerusalem. And they were getting a little bit behind. So Paul would say, I'm going to send someone. I've been bragging about what you said you would do. I hear now you haven't done anything. So I'm going to send these guys, and let's make sure that uh, you're not embarrassed. The person who sows sparingly, verse 6, will reap sparingly. The person who sows generously will reap generously. You reap what you sow. Or like one seamstress sign I saw the other day, we sow, S-E-W, we sow what you rip. <laughs> anyway, each one of you should give as he has decided in his heart. He's not saying 5 or 10 or 15% here. As each one has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or because you have to, as it was in the Old Covenant under Moses. You have to tithe 10%. Because God loves a cheerful giver. No, he says not reluctantly, not because you have to, not under compulsion. Notice that Paul doesn't say, of course, give at least 10%, which is the tithe. He never mentions it. As each one has decided in his heart. You see the difference. God is now judging our hearts. For more clarity, let's go to 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9, Paul makes the argument there that Corinth and all the churches should have been supporting him while he was there preaching at him. But many times he had to end up making tents. He had to work for a living, work for an income to buy food because the Corinthian brethren weren't helping him. The Thessalonians weren't helping him. People from Philippi up in Macedonia, north of Corinth and north of Athens, Athens and all that, they were supporting him. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 3 to 14. My defense to those who examine me is this. Do we not have a right 
to eat and drink? Do we have no right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles, not only just to support us, but a wife who would come with us, as the brothers of the Lord, that's James and Jude, and Cephas, is Peter, or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? Are you saying we really have to go out there and make tents and leather work and everything else because you won't feed us? You won't give us food and drink, place to stay? Whoever goes to war at his own expense. This is new covenant on supporting God's work now. We're reading. Who plants a vineyard doesn't eat of its fruit. Who tends a flock does not drink of the milk of the flock. No, I say these things as do I say these things as a mere man? Verse 8, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 8. Doesn't the law say the same thing? It's written in the law of Moses. Don't muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, while it's going that circle, the big stone there that's crushing the corn, the wheat, whatever it is. Let that ox eat. Paul says, Is God really all that concerned about the ox? Was that really the point? Or does he say it all together for our sakes? It's for our sakes. No doubt it's written that he who plows should plow in hope and he who threshes in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your, spirit, or your material things? We have been feeding you Spiritually, is it so much to ask that you feed us physically? That's what Paul's saying. If others are partakers of this right over you, are we not even more? So other ministers would come in and they'd take care of them, but not Paul and Barnabas for some reason. Nevertheless, we have not used this right, verse 12, the end of it, but endure all things lest we hinder the gospel, the good news of Christ. Do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the temple? If you came in with a peace offering, there was a meal afterwards between you and God and the priest. There was a meal afterwards of that peace offering that you brought. The, the, you know, the, the sheep or the goat or cow or whatever. Even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel... If you preach the gospel, he said, live from the gospel. We just read it. I think that's in Luke 10, verse 8, something like that. Um, they have a right to live from the gospel. Paul goes on to say in 1 Timothy, are, are, you, are you grasping this? He's saying if you're being fed by people, whether on TV or video or CDs or whatever, or on the computer or by notes that you get, if you're being fed by them, send them some, some help. Help them out. I hope you're being fed by light on the rock. You may be being fed by several sources. Send some support. That's what Paul is saying. 1 Timothy 5, verses 17 to 18, Let the elders, the ministers, who rule well, be counted worthy of double honor. Now he's going to put that double honor in context of material help especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. That's what Light on the Rock is all about. For the scripture says, don't muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Luke 10, verse 8, from Christ himself. What's Paul saying? If you're being fed by a true minister of God, send something to him. You should be supporting that same minister with your contributions. The amount is something you decide in your own heart. It's what God puts on your heart and what you follow God's lead to do. And now it is in money, in coin, perhaps also a portion of your grain or first fruits of the ministers in your local area. I would suppose many people are being fed from various sources. So if you had $100 and you have five different sources that, that we're feeding you spiritually, that you're happy with, and you feel are correct biblical doctrines from your examination of them, then you would divide that up, in my opinion, 20 bucks a piece would go to these people, or if you talk about a thousand, then it'd be 200 bucks a piece. So anyway, um, I'll be frank, I can no longer work full time, I have different health issues, 
and, and stress reasons. I need to stop. I don't want to have a heart attack or stroke like every one of my siblings and my mom and my grandfather. My full-time work right now is light on the rock. I spend my whole time, besides walking my dog, trying to get my health going better, uh, light on the rock is my full-time work. Besides our contributions and tithe, there are about four others who do send money on a regular basis, varies from $35 on, on, on up to help us buy the ads once in a while or to buy the equipment we need, the camera to make this video, the green screen behind that allows us to put pictures behind you, and these great big studio type lights in front of me that you don't see, light up my beautiful face. <laughs> anyway, it's my full-time work. So yes, we could use your help also. As Paul is saying, I'm feeling led by God, I feel, to buy some ads into areas where we don't normally go. I'd like to take Light on the Rock to the whole world. So buy ads where people in the Islamic world, the Hindu world, the Buddhist world, China and, and Russia and South America and Africa, that they can all hear these messages. That's going to cost some money. Cost we don't have right now, but when we do have some, we buy an ad here or there. If you can help us, thank you. That's what Paul and Jesus are saying. We also help the very poor people of Kenya. There are a couple ministries there that we have been helping out. They have orphans. They have poor congregations. Sometimes they have no food. We bought one group, every one in the church area there, a mosquito net. They're getting too much malaria. Many of them could not afford the $8 for a mosquito net. So we bought it. I'm not bragging. I'm telling you what we do with the money. And then we send the kids to school, buy their uniforms, pay their tuitions, not free schooling over there. Buy food, buy bunk beds, buy mattresses. Okay, I could go on and on, but you get the point. You can contribute some to us and know for sure that it's going to be helping a lot of people. If you wish to donate at Light on the Rock, just go to our website, lightontherock.org. At the top of the page, you'll see About. Click on that, and then it will. if you click on it, it'll say Donate to LOTR, which is Light on the Rock. Hit the yellow Donate box and take it from there, pay by PayPal or credit card. Anyway, thank you. Thank you if you do that. I've only got four people sending a little bit of money here and there right now, which I deeply appreciate. Let's pick up again with knowing that in the Old Covenant there was a festival tithe, a second tithe, tithe for the poor. I hope you got the idea of what it is in the New Covenant. Now, the New Covenant is support those who are preaching the word. If you want to give a full 10%, great. If you want to give 20, 30, or all of what you have, great. It's up to you, and God, God is watching you, okay? Let's pick up with the time I have left. I don't have much time left, but you'll see it in my notes in any, in any case. There were two other tithes mentioned. The first tithe went to the Levites. Get this. Only Levites could eat it. Levites, including priests. Only Levites could eat it. The average Israelite could not. We covered that last time. There was another tithe, and this tithe, the second tithe, was to help the Israelites have money to go to the feast. And so they would tie the 10% that they would use at the holy days, especially the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem. It's called a second tithe or festival tithe. We've done it faithfully for over five decades. In the New Covenant, it's not a required law. That's the honest thing to tell you. We do keep the holy days. The church, after all, began on a holy day on Pentecost. Paul openly talks about Passover in 1 Corinthians 5 and 1 Corinthians 11. They obviously kept the holy days, even Gentiles did. So I go to the Feast of Tabernacles. And there's a cost involved, so make sure you're saving enough. We have all these years been tithing 10% for the feast. Now, as I understand the New Covenant more, if you need more than 10, then set aside more than 10. If you don't need 10%, it 
you're going somewhere pr pretty close. You don't need to have 10% unless you want to have the 10 and then use some extra to help people who don't have very much. That, that would be great. And, and then when you go to the holy days, let's read Deuteronomy 16, verses 16 and 17. The way it's practiced by some churches, most churches that I have been associated with, they take holy day offerings on all seven holy days. It's not what God says. It's not what God says. Deuteronomy 16, verses 16 and 17. And they read this very verse. Three times, three, not seven, three times a year, all your males shall appear. In practice, sometimes the whole family went. Like even when Jesus was 12 years old, his mom, his dad, and relatives, they were all there in Jerusalem. He got lost. He got forgotten. <laughs> anyway, <coughs> shall all your males appear before Yehovah, your God, in the place which he chooses at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that's number one, Feast of Weeks, that's Pentecost, number two, and at the Feast of Tabernacles. And they shall not appear before Yehovah empty-handed. Say Yehovah, your Bible says the Lord in all big caps, and that's Y-H-V-H, the Tetragrammaton. Some people think it's pronounced Yahweh, other think it's pronounced Yehovah. I say Yehovah, and I have good reason to. Every man shall give as he is able. This is not tithe. This is an offering, a holy day offering. God doesn't say how much. Give as he's able according to how much God's blessed you. According to the blessing of Jehovah your God which he has given you. So at the first day of unleavened bread, on the day of Pentecost, and Feast of Pentecost, and the, and, and, and the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles, we are to collect Holy Day offerings and you are to have an offering ready. These are the three specifically mentioned. I've heard many, many ministers, many, probably dozens over the 50 years, say that when it says three times, the word there could be seasons, three seasons. Yeah, there's a season in the spring, but there's two holy days in the spring, first and last day of unleavened bread. And then you have Pentecost, and then you have the season in the fall. We have trumpets, atonement, and so they end up collecting on seven. But three specific holy days are named by name. So there's no confusion what he means by three times. So when I'm conducting a service, let's say on Feast of Trumpets, I do not collect a holy day offering because it's not mentioned in Deuteronomy 16. Those are the three. How much is how much you feel God's blessed you? To whom? Well, to whomever you feel in the new covenant is feeding you God's word. Now the second tithe, the Bible talks about a second. Remember the first tithe was to be eaten, was to be given only to the Levites. Was to be eaten only by the Levites anywhere they chose. This other tithe we're going to read about is collected and saved by the tither and eaten in Jerusalem or wherever God was placing his name. And it was to be shared with the Levites. That's why a lot of Levites, a lot of spiritual Levites, ministers, don't save a second tithe because they think, no, you guys are supposed to help us with that. I'm not kidding you. Many, many, many do not, though they teach a second tithe, do not themselves collect it or save it themselves. Ask them. So anyway, first tithe went to the Levites. This other tithe we're about to read was eaten by the tither. It has to be a different tithe, therefore. I don't go along with those who say there was one tithe used different ways. It's too confusing because the first one was for the Levites to eat. This is now for the tither to eat. You, Deuteronomy 14, verses 22 to 27. Deuteronomy 14, 22 to 27. You shall truly tithe of all the increase of your grain that the field produces year by year. And you, not the Levites, and you shall eat before Jehovah your God in the place he chooses. It's not just Jerusalem anymore. We feel, you know, we, we find a place where we're going to keep the Feast of Tabernacles and we announce this is a place God has chosen. I'm a little uncomfortable with that, but that's what it says here place where he chooses to make his name abide, the tithe of your grain, that tithe means 10%, 
your new wine and your oil. That was real wine. I heard so many sermons. Say, of course, back then that meant grape juice. Nonsense. What a bunch of poppycock. That was wine, you guys. Wine. Prove that sometime. I'll maybe write a blog on it just to prove it. So, it's, so it'll be on the light of the rock. Of the firstborn of your herds and flocks, that you may learn to fear Jehovah your God always. If the journey's too long and you don't want to carry all that down there, you can change it into money. Verse 25, they'll take the money into your hand, go to the place which Jehovah your God chooses, and you shall spend that money for whatever your heart desires. I would add the words to eat in context. I don't think he means you can use that money. I, I desire a portion. I have, I'm a millionaire, so I've got... I've got hundred thousand dollars in tithes here so I'm gonna buy a Porsche no it's not what it's saying for oxen or sheep or wine or similar drink whatever your heart desires you shall eat there you can't eat your Porsche okay you shall eat there before the Lord your God and you shall rejoice you in your household and don't forget the Levite forsake the Levite who is within your gates for he has no part or inheritance so yeah in the Old Covenant, the second tithe was given and shared with the ministry, the Levites. I'm just giving you the scriptures that people talk about, second tithe, third tithe, just so you know the verses are there. These scriptures are not in the New Covenant. They're not in the New Covenant. So first tithe was eaten only by Levites. This tithe, the second tithe, was shared with Levites, but eaten primarily by the tither. Um... Then we come to a third tithe, a poor tithe. Josephus, the historian for the Jews, in the time like 30 years or so after Christ, or 40 years after Christ, he talks about a second tithe and a poor fund, third tithe. He, he does. Um, basically what the poor tithe was in the third year, your year of tithing, it says, that money was stored up and then given to the poor that you knew in your gates, not sent to some central office in Pasadena or someplace. No, this was, this was something you kept and you shared it with people in, around you, within your gates. Third year, sixth year, and then the tenth year, and the thirteenth year, and so on. And the Old Covenant in the third and sixth year out of a seven-year cycle, the poor tithe went to the poor. We have practiced that, and we can settle into the, if we're not careful, the, the main point in the New Covenant is don't forget there are still poor people that Yeshua himself identifies with as himself. And don't just say you'll pray for them. Look what it says in James chapter 2, verses 15 and to 17. James 2, 15 to 17. This is New Covenant. If a brother or sister is naked, needs food, is destitute of daily food, and one of you says, depart in peace. Well, I hope things go better for you. I'll be praying for you. Be warm, be filled. But you don't give them the things that they need for the body. What good did you do? What good did you do? That's also faith by itself. If it doesn't have works, it's dead. Isn't that what we say? Oh, I'm so sorry for you. But then we do nothing. If you would like to help keep orphans alive, to keep very, very poor brethren not being bitten by mosquitoes and getting fed, getting helped when they weren't allowed to leave their homes and had no food, we will share what you share with us, with people like that. I'm finding it hard to do as much as is needed to be done just four or five people periodically contributing something, or some do every month. But remember, especially when we help the poor, Jesus takes it personally. Remember the story of the sheep and the goats? The sheep on the, on the, on the, on, anyway, uh, let's, let's read it. The sheep on the right hand, the goats on the left. In, Ma in Matthew 25, verses 31 to 40, let's, let's post it, we'll start reading it. Whatever we do for the poor, especially the poor brethren, Jesus takes it personally. When the Son of Man, Matthew 25, verse 31, we'll read the verse 40, comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, 
Then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him. He will separate them from each other, a shepherd decide, like a shepherd dividing a sheep from the goats. He'll set the sheep on the right, the goats on the left. The king will say to those on the right hand, the sheep, Come, you blessed of my father. Boy, do I want to hear that. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Long before you were born, there's a kingdom being prepared for you. For I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came and visited me. When's the last time you went to prison to visit? When was the last time you gave clothing to somebody? That's what we do here at Light on the Rock for those we, as many as we can. Then the righteous will say to him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you thirsty and give you drink and see you as a stranger and took you in naked and clothed you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? Verse 40, the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, and as much as the, you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. I know it says my brethren, but you know what? If you see an old woman, she's not even asking for money. She's pushing a shopping cart she took somewhere and it's got all loaded down with bags and things and she's sleeping on the streets. Maybe that's a test to see if you're going to help one of the least of these. My brethren. So what if you get taken care of, I mean, taken advantage of once in a while? So what? I'd rather be taken advantage of a lot, but it helped somebody along the lines. My point is be generous. In the New Covenant, there's not a 10% third tithe. There really isn't. It's not, in the, it's not in the New Covenant. What's in the New Covenant is someone's poor and needy and needing clothing and in prison. Go see them. I know someone in prison. I'm trying to work it out so I can go see him. The point is take care of the poor as much as you can. For many of us, it was a third tithe. We did too in the third year, sixth year out of seven and so on. In the new covenant, that's not specified. The new covenant, what is specified is you might be doing it to Jesus himself if you take care of someone who's poor. If you go visit someone in, in jail or prison, someone who's sick, or poor widow. We're not given a percentage of how much could be any amount. Anyway, that's what's taught in the New Covenant. There's a lot of discussion about three ties, but there's not a law in the New Covenant that says there's any tithe. There's a lot stated in the government of support those who are feeding you, support where God is working, and don't think it has to be just the big guys who can print booklets and books and be on TV and radio and have a whole host of people producing everything. It might just be individuals. I mean, the 12 apostles, the 12 disciples, 12's not very many. Who knows? I mean, when Philip went and spoke to the Ethiopian eunuch, that was one guy. And there was also a lot of discussion in the back and forth in preparing for all this about what increase means. In the New Covenant, it's moot. It's, not a, it's, it's a moot point. You give as you're able in your heart, led by God, blessed by God, not just on certain percentages or increase or no increase. God isn't working with just the kingdom of Israel and Judah anymore. The law of tithing was all of you who are in the kingdom of Israel or who live in the kingdom of Israel. There was one law for everybody. So if you're a Gentile living there, you had to also tithe. There's nothing I can find where God is saying, I want tithing now to start to Egypt, to be coming from Greece, to be coming from Persia, to be coming from Ethiopia. I, I, I don't find that. It was a law for the kingdom of Israel. Now we are the Israel of God. Now we are spiritual Jews. Romans 2 says that. We're circumcised in our heart. We have God's law written in our heart, not on seat seat that we wear. But, you know, the, the tassels. But written in our hearts as we study God's word. And we give to the poor. Much has changed since the new covenant has started. Now God is going to all the world, not just to Israel. 
first he said, stay away from the Samaritans, stay away from the Gentiles, go just to the, law, the land of, of, of lost sheep of Israel. Later on in Acts 1, he says, go to all the world, starting right here in Jerusalem, go to Samaria. Now he's saying, go to Samaria. He himself went to Samaria. John 4, one of the greatest chapters in the Bible. There's no physical temple. I know we're the temple. There are no physical Levites. So much has changed. And now we tithe from our heart in literal, real money that literally feeds the poor, dresses the naked, and clothes and helps everybody according to what our heart is leading us to give. And God is watching. And as much as you did it unto me, you've done to the least of these, my brethren. Come, you blessed, inherit the kingdom prepared for you who are understanding the new covenant tithing, which is even better and stronger. It's not just every third year now. We're to be generous to the poor all the time. As far as I can read it, you saw me naked and you took care of me if it was the third year. He, he didn't say that. He didn't say that. I hope this sermon is making you think. And he totally expects you to support those who are feeding you, who are giving you truth. truth, And he doesn't put a percentage limit on you, like 10%. It could be more, it could be less, whatever your heart and ability allows. He doesn't now limit it to grain, wine, oil, and herds and flocks. It's whatever you have now in the new covenant. We're supported by money now in the new covenant. That's what pays the bills. That's what buys the ads that we might start doing. We've done some ads. We haven't done very many. But they do seem to reach much greater audience. Yes, we're supposed to support where God is working, okay? And now believe me, I don't believe that's just in one place anymore. May God bless you as you live by these words. Father in heaven, wow, do we just say wow to you, Father. That you've called us out of this world and you've opened our hearts and minds to you, to see you, to love you. We praise you. Please, Father, bless those who understand this and apply this and help the poor and, and help where you are working and help us get the word out to all the world, all the world, all of us who are preaching the kingdom of God and the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ also who makes the way possible into the kingdom. He is the way, the life. He is all of it. And he's the truth. So, Jesus, Yeshua, there, the right hand of God, hear my prayer. Bless those who are contributing, who are tithing, who are helping, who are helping support those who are feeding them. Help them come to understand they've been taught tithing wrongly for so long. Help them understand the truth of the new covenant. That again, it's of the heart, it's of the spirit. But you do expect us to be giving, to be a very giving kind of people. We praise you, we thank you, we glorify your name. Thank you, Jesus, for all you've done for us. Father, thank you so much. What a wonderful Abba, great Father you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 600 sermons and blogs as a scriptural study reference for those who desire to have a closer relationship with God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ and learn more about His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are greatly appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting, and if you find the site beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.